Evening, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to uh, an experience I, I think you'll uh, value and enjoy very, very much. It's just such a treat and a thrill to welcome to Purdue someone I have um, admired a long time and known personally for most of that time. Uh, someone all of America knows is one of our premier public journalists. And I think she's earned the, uh, I'm going to say, uh, rare, nearly unique esteem in which she is held, the old-fashioned way. Uh, Mara Lyson has, uh, for uh, better part of three decades, been one of uh, the premier uh, reporters covering the most important events in our uh, public life, on the Hill, the White House, and everywhere in between, and governmental activities, politics, and the rest. And uh, through it all, uh, maintained and built a reputation for fairness, for insight, for savvy uh, that uh, is certainly not surpassed by anybody I can think of. I have to say that uh, that uh, she represents to me increasingly unusual traits that were maybe once a little more common. She has a healthy skepticism uh, for people in public uh, life and for their claims and for their pretensions and so forth, but uh, uh, at least in my observation, maintain some sense of empathy for those people who do enter the arena and each in her or his own way try to um, make our, our national life better. And um, secondly, she has, I think, uh, um, maintained a scrupulous uh, objectivity uh, that uh, never once, I, I'm confident this is true, never once has anyone suspected any sort of an of a agenda of, of her own. And um, uh, sad to say, in my opinion, that's not it's always so true anymore. I, uh, she is uh, maybe emblematic of that. She occupies important uh, repertorial positions simultaneously and has now for uh, 16 years or so at National Public Radio and Fox News. <laughs> Only someone who is uh, understood to be uh, truly uh, impartial and truly interested only in the public interest uh, likely to bring off that sort of double. She's a graduate of, of Brown University uh, and um, again has, has been uh, now for um, apparently since she left Brown, because it's been almost 30 years, um, a central figure in our national life. Please welcome uh, our good friend uh, and uh, uh, one of America's most important journalists, Mara Lassen. As has been our practice at some similar uh, forum, forums, I'll, I'll ask a few questions for a while, but we have microphones on uh, both uh, outside aisles, and, and uh, after a few minutes, certainly invite anyone present, students uh, get preference, but anyone present to uh, step to the mic and we'll, we'll uh, alternate sides and let the audience uh, drive the, most of the discussion. Um, Mara would, I'm sure, prefer not to talk about herself, but I'm going to insist that she do just for a little while. Uh, you've led a remarkable career, and I'd like you just to talk a little bit to the audience about that career, what, what uh, uh, led you to seek it, and uh, maybe some of the changes you've seen. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for that incredible introduction. I just want to say I'm really happy to be here at your impressive university, and I'm thrilled to be on stage with Mitch Daniels, who I really enjoyed covering when he was his former self. Um, and national politics is poorer for his absence, so it's Purdue's gain and the rest of ours loss uh, that he's no longer in the political arena, but he's doing really important work here. So I'm really happy to be here. And the boring part of the program is when I tell you about my career, such as it is. Um, I went to Brown. I, I majored in American history, so I've always been interested in history and politics. And 
how change is made and how people make it. And after, while I was in college, actually, I got a summer internship at the Vineyard Gazette, which is a little newspaper on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. I worked there in the summer, and then when I graduated, I came back and I worked there year round. Um, and I, uh, after that, I took the Greyhound bus for $55 and a bunch of tahini sandwiches out to California to look for a job. And I wanted to work for a big, bigger newspaper, and I didn't find a job out there. I got a job for a nonprofit organization, which I did for a couple years. And then one day, I was driving over the Bay Bridge. I turned on the radio, and I heard a friend of mine from college on the radio. His name was Michael Curtin, and he, I think, ended up getting a PhD in teachers' communications in Michigan or something. But anyway, there he was on the radio, and I called him up, and I said, Michael, how did you get to do this? He was working for a community radio station in Berkeley. He said, come on over. We have volunteers. I'm going to show you, you know, how it's done. I went over there. I volunteered. Um, at the, around that time, NPR was starting a bureau in San Francisco. I got a job there. Uh, we... At that time, uh, all the public broadcasting stations in California formed a consortium. We had a Sacramento bureau covering the state capitol. We put out a daily show that was modeled on All Things Considered, but it was shorter. It was called California Edition. And I was the host, producer, janitor, um, and, uh, and uh, bottle washer. So I did that for a while. Then the California Public Broadcasting Commission got line item vetoed um, by the governor. And I freelanced for a couple years. I'm going to try to make this really short. Um, and then in 1985, NPR hired me to be the um, morning edition newscaster. And for those of you who listen to the program, there's a five-minute hard news insert at the top and the bottom of the hour. I was the bottom of the hour. I worked from 3 a.m. to noon um, for one year and 11 months. But who's counting? I was counting every single minute. And then I w became uh, the weekend duty reporter. So I really did climb the ladder there. The weekend duty reporter works Wednesday to Sunday. I did that. And um, then I was, got a journalism fellowship at Columbia, and I went away for nine months. Uh, during that time, just to tell you a little bit about NPR and uh, the kind of incredible female role models that I had when I got there, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, Koki Roberts, Linda Wertheimer. I mean, there were incredible women journalists there. A lot of people ask me, you know, about my experiences as a woman in journalism. To me, I, I followed in the wake of the greats. And maybe it was because NPR paid so poorly that we had so many women in top positions. But they were there and they were really wonderful. And while I was at Columbia, uh, I literally have been helped up the ladder by these women, literally. Koki called me to say, whatever they offer you, don't take it because there's going to be a spot in Congress, you know, working with me. So I get the call from the news director, we want you to move to Atlanta. And I said, no, I can't take it, you know, and I'm sure he was stunned. But anyway, I did exactly what Koki told me. I came back and I started work and I got the job on the Hill with her covering Congress. In 1992, I was assigned to cover Bill Clinton who was running for president. And sometimes when you cover the guy who wins, you get to become the White House correspondent. So I covered the White House during the Clinton administration. And at the end of it, I became the national political correspondent, which I am to this day. And I am, since Barack Obama was elected, I'm part of the White House rotation, which means every, there's two other people who cover the White House with me. Uh, every third week, one of us is physically there doing the daily stories. The, the other two are doing uh, features, analytical pieces. In election years, I travel around to do stories on races. I just came back from North Carolina, where I did a piece on uh, field operations, get out the vote efforts, which have become extremely high tech at the same time as they are very much like people did it in the 19th century, going door to door talking to their neighbors, but they got a lot of algorithms behind them. Um, so that's what I do, and I've had a wonderful time there. Uh, I've worked at NPR since 1985. I always say I started when I was 12. Um, and uh, I started working at Fox. I appear, as Mitch explained, I appear on the week, about once a week on the weekday program special report, and then sometimes on Sundays. So I've been doing that since 1998. And 
I think later we'll talk a little bit about political polarization, but the media is polarized too, and I feel like I am the exception that proves the rule. Um, people say MSNBC and Fox don't even cover the same natural disasters. <laughs> um, but, you know, I feel very comfortable uh, showing up on Fox, working for NPR. I don't say, I say the same things wherever I am. Um, and I feel that that experience has really enriched my reporting, even if it's given heartburn to some of the listeners of both outlets. Um, so I'm having, I am having a wonderful time. Uh, there have been a tremendous number of changes, obviously, in my profession, but I do think there is always a place for straight ahead, down the middle analytical reporting. I mean, I really do. Despite everything else, every other centrifugal or centripetal, I'm not sure, force in politics and journalism, there's still a place to be kind of firmly anchored in the middle. Let me ask you about one of those changes uh, that uh, uh, you never, I'm going to say, succumbed to, uh, never engaged in at least. Um, starting somewhere, I'm in the last couple decades or so, it's, it's become, first it was a startling or noteworthy exception, then it became more common. Now it's entirely commonplace for people in journalism to go through a revolving door into active political activity and then sometimes come back again as though, and we're supposed to accept them as though they're uh, fair, balanced, and impartial, even though they may have just come out of a highly partisan activity. Um, is that a healthy trend? Is, that, is it an acceptable trend? How do you look well, at that? Well, first of all, we're not I don't think we should accept them as fair, balanced, and impartial because usually they're not. Now, I think there's, it's one model to be a William Sapphire, write speeches for Nixon, and that'd be a conservative columnist. That's okay. I mean, you know where he was coming from before, and you know where he's coming from afterwards. That's okay. Um, it's one thing to be, and of course, one of the reasons people do this now is there's a huge explosion in the punditocracy where there's a lot of you know, there's a market for people who have strong opinions and are partisans on either side. That's one thing, but the model Mitch is talking about is a little bit different, where you literally kind of go back and forth across the line as if you can be impartial as a journalist. I really don't think you can. Um, maybe one 180 degree re revolution will accept, but the 360, I think is just too much. And um, it's funny because that's never ever crossed my mind. I mean, literally never crossed my mind because it's just completely different. Now, there are people, David Axelrod, the president's former political guru, he was a journalist, but he got bitten by the bug of polling and, and politics and he left and that was it. And he never came back. So that's why I'll take the 180 degrees. I just don't want the 360. <laughs> No, in fact, I talked with David about this once, and, and he and I remember a time when it did happen. And some, it'd be a, but that was it. You, you were tainted right. goods. You could yeah. not come back because no self-respecting. Yeah. 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 Uh, news, you, were, you were, from that point on, you were a yeah. marked man or woman. So. so you mentioned polarization, which bothers a lot of us and, and bothers us in terms of, I, I think, in two ways. One is just the simple um, harshness and coarseness and negativity that it tends to accompany it in our, in our public uh, debates and, and in our campaigns. Um, but maybe even more important, the way in which it may get in the way of addressing major national issues that are um, not going away. Um, how do you look at it? Uh, is, and uh, is it really worse as we tell ourselves it is, is it really worse than many periods in our history where, as they say, politics was never beanbag? I think that the partisanship was ever thus. The gridlock is something new, and I'd make a distinction. I mean, people have always had brutal, nasty campaigns, and at least now they're not beating each other up with canes on the Senate floor. That's one thing. There always was extreme partisanship and divisions. But now we're not getting anything done. And I think that's something that's completely different. It's fine to have very different opinions, uh, different beliefs about government, but at some point you've got to come together and make a compromise to do basic things that need to get done in the country. I'm not talking about one side capitulating to the other. I'm talking about making a hard fought principled compromise. And I think that's what upsets people the most. It's not just that politics 
is mean and vicious, it's that nothing is happening in Washington. And I do think this, I mean, academics who study this say this current Congress has been the least productive Congress ever. Um, when you see the most basic functions, passing a budget, you know, confirming nominees, I mean, you know, increasing the debt limit, um, keeping the government open. I mean, these are basic, basic functions. That's what I think is different. Statistically, I, we, we've all seen these studies which show that the overlap in terms of, of viewpoints or votes cast, mm -hmm. well, there was once a rather extensive overlap. Uh, members of the Democratic Party, many of them would, right. uh, would uh, often vote with certain members of the Republican Party and vice versa. Um, statistically, I think it is now demonstrable that there has been, there's never in recent memory been this kind of separation? There's no doubt. The, 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 I think, based on the re voting records of the current United States Senate, there is not a single Democrat with a more moderate or conservative voting record than a single Republican. And as Mitch explained, there used to be plenty of moderate or liberal Republicans, you know, Jacob Javits, people like that. On the Democratic side, there were lots of moderate to conservative Democrats, and the overlap between those two wings of the parties made the center of the political spectrum, and that's where deals got made and compromises got made. And for, there's a whole lot of reasons why there is now just a big black abyss between the parties. I mean, in the House, part of that is how district lines are drawn. I think right now, 90 3% of Republicans in the House of Representatives represent a district that Mitt Romney won. And 96% of the Democrats in the House represent a district that Barack Obama won. There's absolutely no overlap at all. And the tragedy is, to the extent that there are any moderate to conservative Democrats left, a big handful of them are going to lose this year, and we're going to be even more sorted out. And in 2016, when you've got a lot of Republicans from blue states up for re-election, a lot of them are going to lose too. So I don't see anything kind of reversing that trend. There are, in addition to gerrymandering and the way district lines are drawn, um, the population is even sorting itself out. Some of this is our fault. Um, people tend to live near people who think like them. They listen to media that they agree with. And um, there was a recent poll, Pew, the Pew Research Center took a poll and they found that 49% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats said they were, would be very unhappy if their child married someone of the opposite party. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, th this polarization, I think, is one of the most important dynamics uh, in American life today. I, I should have uh, tipped you that I might ask this question, but it occurs to me to ask, uh, can you name somebody, one, one, one from column A and one from B, one Republican, one Democrat, in, currently serving in Washington, who you think might be, uh, uh, who, who is admirable in this respect, who is willing to work across lines, who might be a model or um, uh, the initiator of, of some sort of movement uh, under the right circumstances? Mm. I think there are people who, who really want to do this. I mean, Ron Wyden from Oregon has made plenty of, of deals with Republicans and done good constructive work. As a matter of fact, I think uh, when he worked with, with Bennett from Utah, the guy lost his job because he worked with Ron Wyden. I mean, the problem is, is that it's now become sacrilege to, to work across party lines. Um, John McCain, sometimes he's a hyperpartisan, but he and Lindsey Graham have worked across the aisle plenty of times. Um, there are a lot of, there's actually more members than you think who are willing to do it, but the forces pulling them apart are so severe. Marco Rubio made, worked very hard to pass the immigration reform bill in the Senate, four Democrats, four Republicans, the gang of eight. Um, and what happened after that bill was passed? He got torn to shreds by conservative talk radio and he had to disavow it. And, you know, I think that's really unfortunate. You know, you've got the bases of both parties that think compromise is a dirty word. And, um, you know, it takes real, real leadership to buck those trends. Uh, you're a history major, and you're on a college campus, so let me ask you a question that uh, um, I know you've given some uh, thought to, because we, we talked about it briefly. Uh, survey out last week, hardly the first one we've seen. They come out about once a year. 
um, revealing an unmistakable historical and civic illiteracy among the American people, including graduates of some of our most prestigious schools can't answer the most basic questions that once upon a time any middle school student could tell you the answer to. Um, big problem, small problem, what do we do about it? Huge problem and it scares me to death. I mean, it just, just really does. I mean, that just basic civics, you know, understanding that one third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years, you know, understanding how things work. I mean, I don't, I think it's a huge problem. I think an uneducated, historically, financially illiterate population is, is a very bad thing for democracy. How we solve it, I think you have, it has to start in, in grade school. There should be civics education. There should be, I mean, I, I don't want to get into a hornet's nest, but the common core, the idea behind it, that there are basic things that every kid should learn in America, I think that's what we have to do. So I'm going to ask Mara to do a little bit of prognosticating. The election the season is here. In fact, it's right upon us. But uh, as I do, it would be a good time for those of you who have questions to migrate to the mics, and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll move to the, the uh, audience's uh, interrogation just as fast as we can. So Mara, um, you say you're just back from one of these uh, many uh, Senate races. Uh, talk to us about the impending Senate election. and. And, and I hope as part of it, uh, when you're done uh, forecasting, that uh, you'll tell us if, as uh, many accounts suggest, if control shifts, what's that likely to mean? What would, what would, how would it change things, if at all, in a, uh, in a next Congress, if, the, if, the, uh, if control of the U.S. Senate shifted? Okay. That's actually a really good question, because some people, a lot of voters say, how would we even know? Nothing's happening now. You know, what does it matter who controls the Senate? But I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so just little historical background. No president has ever hung on to, his, if he had one, a Senate majority in the second term, midterm. Unless you count LBJ, who didn't really have a second term. So history tells us the Democrats should lose the Senate this year. And I think they probably will. And just to give you a little picture of what the map looks like, the battleground looks like, the Republicans need a net six seat pickup to take control of the Senate, and the Senate is the big prize. Nothing's gonna change in the House. Republicans might get anywhere from eight to 12 uh, seat pickup. If they do, by the way, if they get 13, I think, 12 or 13, they'll have the biggest majority since the 1940s of, that any Republican majority. Anyway, in the Senate, I think that when you look at the pool that Republicans are fishing in to get their six seats, it's a pretty big pool. I think they'll get the three red states where Democrats are retiring, Montana, South Dakota, and West Virginia. The next tier are Democratic incumbents in red states, Alaska, Arkansas, and Louisiana. In all those three states, Republicans are ahead in the polls. There you have six right there. Um, however, much to Republicans' surprise and everybody else's surprise, they, Republicans could lose the seat in Georgia. Um, not clear, but Michelle Nunn, who's the daughter of Sam Nunn, is running ahead in the polls there. That's a state that's pretty red, but it's trending purple. Maybe not this year, but that's where it's headed in the future. And then you've got Colorado and Iowa. Those are two states, unlike all the other ones I just listed, those are two states that are blue states that Obama did win. And the Democrats should be holding on to those, but they're very, very, very tight races, and the Republicans are hopeful about those too. So even if they picked up their six, lost Georgia, they could still get Colorado and Iowa. So they, they have some room for error. And this is a battleground, just by luck of the draw, the class of 2014, mostly red states. These are states that Mitt Romney won. And uh, one of the things that we always look at in an election year is what is a president's approval rating because that's the, one of the biggest, most important political indicators for how his party will do. The president is relatively unpopular. He's hovering around 40%. He is a drag on Democrats. But in the Senate battleground, in these red states, his approval rating is even lower. And I think the Republicans have hit on an extremely simple message this year that they think is gonna work for them. And it really is just two words. Obama bad. And um, that's, you know, that's kind of what they're arguing and the Democrats are trying to hang on by, the, by their fingernails, by trying to make these races into, into 
uh, choices between two candidates. So my prognostication is Republicans will probably get the Senate. The question is, what difference will it make? A narrow Republican majority, why would anything more get done than under the current narrow Democratic majority where nothing is getting done? Um, first of all, it does matter who controls the Senate. Uh, I think the president's life will be a little more miserable if, if the Republicans control the Senate. But there is a theory that divided governments are more productive. And recently I saw a chart that showed how the, the uh, productivity of divided government, where one party has the White House and another party has both houses of Congress. That's the most productive model, believe it or not. Even more than unified government, when one party has the House, Senate, and the White House. And certainly more productive than what we have now, which is a split Congress. Democrats have the Senate, Republicans have the House. So it is possible that if Republicans have control of Congress, they'll have some responsibility for governing. Their first priority won't be just to block the president's agenda. And the president, with only two years left, will be very interested in his legacy. Maybe there'll be some compromises on things that everybody, everybody agrees has to happen, even though they disagree on the details. I don't think we'll get a grand bargain on tax reform and entitlement reform, but that would be something that would be a great thing. Immigration reform, investments in education and infrastructure, maybe some trade deals. Those are some basic things that maybe, maybe both sides would be willing to compromise on. The other kind of interesting thing is that in 2016, lots of Republicans in blue states are up for re-election. Uh, presidential elections are harder for Republicans than midterms. And maybe those blue state senators like Mark Kirk in Illinois or Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania will be motivated maybe to look for some compromises uh, as they get ready to run for re-election in an environment that will be more favorable to Democrats. So that's the, that's the rosy scenario. The other side, probably more realistic, more gridlock, but more clarifying gridlock, because one will we'll at least have clearer lines drawn. White House is a you know, Democrat, Congress is Republican, and whatever happens in the next two years will lay the groundwork for the 2016 presidential race. The, the White House you covered was certainly an example where a whole lot of things happened after the executive and legislative branches were in different hands. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, Bill Clinton, no yeah. doubt about it. As a matter of fact, that was a pretty productive time. Worked out pretty well for the president, actually. Yep, worked yeah. out well for the president. Now, of course, Republicans overreached, which really worked out well for the president. Right. But even so, the point is divided Congresses, um, divided Congresses can be productive. And let's hope, if we get one, that that's the case. All right, well, uh, let's, uh, let's start over here. I think you were first uh, up, so please ask the first question. And uh, hi, I'm Spencer Deville. I'm an engineering student here at Purdue. Um, how do you think the lack of participation by our own age group, the, college, the 18 to 25 year olds, has affected the political climate in Washington and also the effect on our lives as young adults? Well, I think anytime someone doesn't vote or participate, it's bad for the country, it's bad for their generation. There's just, it's just bad. Now, we'll, I will say this, that, that I'll expand your generation a little bit. 18 to 32 year olds, the millennials, are very soon gonna be the biggest demographic slice of the electorate, bigger than the baby boom was. They're gonna be 40% of the electorate by 2020. That is a huge, huge uh, chunk of the electorate. And um, I think that young people do participate. They don't participate in the numbers of older people, but they tend to participate more as they grow older. Um, and both parties are working really, really hard to engage them. The Democrats to keep them, because of course they already vote two to one for Democrats, and the Republicans to figure out how do they reach out to them. And this is another thing that I find really, really interesting. You know, I'm old enough to have covered the Democrats finding a way out of the political wilderness after they'd lost the White House many, many times in a row. Now the Republicans are in a very similar situation where they've lost the popular vote in five out of six of the last presidential elections. And, may, and I believe that if they are gonna find, the Republicans are gonna find a way out of the political wilderness, find a way to appeal to the rising American electorate, young people, minorities, single women, um, they are gonna have to make some changes. And maybe they'll end up following Mitch's advice, he gave plenty of it to them when he was, when he was in the business of giving advice. And um, I, just to be shamelessly 
flattering of my host here. You guys should just go back and read the CPAC speech or listen to the CPAC speech that he gave. What year was that? Oh, that was uh, early 2011. 2011. Yeah. It's really worth reading. It's really worth listening to or reading because that's exactly what I think the Republican Party will end up doing if it's going to remain viable. And so, but that's what I'm watching for. You know, how, how the, I think young people will be engaged and um, they're going to determine, they will be the balance of power in American politics very soon. Thank you. Over here. Hi, my name is Giovanni Malloy. I'm a sophomore in industrial engineering. And so my question is, who's been the most interesting person or uh, your favorite person to cover and why might that be? Hmm. <laughs> well, there have been a lot of interesting people. You know, as Mitch said earlier, if you cover politics, you can't be cynical. I mean, there's plenty of ridiculousness. You can get disgusted. You just can't be cynical. Um, so there have been lots of really interesting people. I guess Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was so just, there was so much about him that was interesting, infuriating, you know, admirable, smart, exasperating. You know, he was pretty, he was really interesting to cover. Thank you. You know, Lily Tomlin once said, no matter how cynical I get, I can't keep up. <laughs> That's pretty good. I'm glad you never did, yeah, though. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tyler Preston. I'm a freshman here studying mathematics and computer science with a minor in Spanish. And my question is, given the trend that when presidential candidates win, their party generally tends to do well in the Senate and in the House, do you think that in the next presidential election, given that the Democrats do lose in 20, uh, in this election that they could possibly regain the Senate and possibly the House in the following presidential election? Okay, I think it is possible that they could regain the Senate in the next presidential election, just given how many Republicans are up. This year, you have many more Democrats up for re-election than Republicans. 21 Democrats, I think, and seven of them um, uh, are in red states. But in 2016, you've got a ton of Republicans up and very few Democrats. So yes, I think it's possible they could get the Senate back. The House, I think, is just a little tougher until the next census because the way district lines are drawn, they're just very favorable to um, Republicans. Republicans had the very good fortune of surging in 2010 when they made their historic gains in the House, 63 seats. They surged at the perfect year. If you were gonna have a big surge, you wanna do it in a census year you know, in a year where we're redrawing congressional districts, because they took over a lot of state legislatures and were able to draw some pretty favorable districts for themselves. So in the House, I think the, the walls that they've built, are the barriers uh, are pretty high, and it might be till 2020 till you see any big shifts in the House. Just to give you an example of that, um, in 2012, the national vote for the House of Representatives all the Republican candidates combined versus all of the Democratic House candidates combined, the Democratic candidates got 1.4 million more votes for the House than the Republican candidates. But the Republicans still maintained a 34 seat majority in the House of Representatives. And that shows you the power of redistricting. Well, let me but, yeah. press you on that a little bit yeah. though, because two sides play that game. Oh, you bet, and they do. And, <laughs> yeah, and they do. And, and a lot of people, I confess to being one, think this is a fundamental structural flaw we've got that leads to the polarization you talked about. They, every, they draw safe, it's, yep. I don't think it's a problem of one party uh, playing this game better than the other. No, they make a deal. Uh, yeah. they, they prote each protects their yep. incumbents. Yep. And you wind up, that's one thing I think that, uh, back to the earlier question, that harms political participation, there's not too much to vote for if it's lopsided, yep. if it's totally lopsided in a given district. And, uh, and, and then you get people playing to the extremes, Democrats yep. to the most liberal extreme and Republicans the opposite. Isn't this the biggest problem with redistricting? I think that's, that is exactly the biggest problem. And um, the, the thing that's interesting about that is that it's definitely a mutual incumbent protection, you know, uh, racket. And it has some, really bad effects, even for the party that's benefiting from it. Right now, you know, Mitt Romney lost the Hispanic vote 71 to 27% in the presidential election. And the House of Representatives hasn't passed immigration reform, the Senate has. In the House, I think only 25, only something like 10% of Republican House districts represent populations where Hispanics are more than 25%. So they don't have to appeal to Hispanics because, and that's a problem. The Republican Party should have to appeal to a, to a diverse electorate. 
But there are some remedies for that. California has an interesting experiment going on. They've passed something called, well, a couple states have nonpartisan redistricting processes. That's not brand new, where instead of having uh, both parties conspire to protect their incumbents, a nonpartisan commission draws, draws lines that presumably would lead to more competitive congressional districts. But in addition to nonpartisan redistricting in California, they have something called a top two primary. So in these districts, there's one primary, everybody can vote in it, Democratic, Republican, Independent, and, and they vote for candidates from all parties and the top two winners go on to the general election. Could be two Democrats, could be two Republicans, or it could be one of each. Now, the result of that, and it's pretty new, so academics are studying this, California is a very blue state. It hasn't really changed the makeup of the state legislature, which is still heavily Democratic. But what it has done is send more moderate Democrats to, this, to Sacramento who aren't afraid of crossing the aisle and making compromises because they're not afraid of getting a left-wing primary challenge. And the same thing would be true from Republicans. They're not afraid of getting a Tea Party challenge because they're going to participate in this big, wide-open primary. So... That, to me, is a, is a positive reform that I think would help a lot. Over here. Hello. Um, my name is James Uraski, and I'm a sophomore in electrical engineer here. And my question was, about a few months ago, child deportation and their mothers was a big issue. And I remember listening on NPR where there was a lot of talk about an executive order being about to be issued, and it would happen in a few days or next week. And... I don't know if I lost it in the message or if did the White House kind of step away from that issue? Uh, what exactly is your... Yeah, whatever uh, happened to that executive order, right? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. Um, okay, the president, because the House wasn't going to pass immigration reform, announced that he was going to uh, issue some executive orders, deportation relief, basically, like what he did for the Dreamers. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the Dreamers are young people who were brought here as children uh, illegally, and if they went to college or enlisted in the military, they could get deportation relief, only as long as the president's in office, because executive orders only last as long as the president's term. Um, he had announced that he was going to expand that, offer additional deportation relief, uh, before Election Day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, as, ha as has happened so many times with this White House, oops, they reconsidered. The <laughs> child crisis at the border happened. It became a huge campaign issue. Republicans were using it against Democrats. They got a lot of complaints from Congress, from their, their members of their party who were running for re-election. And the president said, OK, I'm still going to do it, but I'm going to do it before the end of the year, you know, after Election Day. I believe he still will. And um, he will issue some kind of immigration reform by executive order. Some more deportation relief, maybe some reform of legal immigration, H-1B-1 visas. There's a lot of things that the business community would like done in immigration reform. None of this is a substitute for passing legislation because it's not permanent. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yes, but that is going to happen. It's been delayed. Okay. Well, that's a great question. Let, let me... Uh, use it as a point of departure to ask you a civics question. There have been an explosion of executive orders in this administration that, to an extent, I don't think anyone ever contemplated before. Rewrite laws. Healthcare law is the best example where the plain language of the statute has been at least postponed you know, and no one's found a legal way to intervene and say, how do you feel about this divorcing you know, the merits of any one decision, mm -hmm. they may all be sound decisions, but as a matter of, of uh, our constitutional system and the uh, separation of powers, how do you feel about, how should we feel about this? Are we being desensitized uh, to uh, action by fiat that uh, ought to be done by representative well, you know, that's mechanisms. a really good question, and some of these executive orders are being challenged in the courts, and I think the courts are going to have to adjudicate this, mm -hmm. whether these things are overstepping the executive's authority or not. But, you know, executive authority is a mutating and malleable thing, and it, you know, there are many Republicans who've tried to expand it, and, and there's a big debate about how far you can go. 
Um, I actually tend to think that for the most part, President Obama's use of executive authority is out of weakness, not strength. I mean, he's doing this because he can't get anything done. And most of the things that he does by executive order are very narrow and unsubstantial. I mean, he can raise the minimum wage under some federal contractors. He can't raise the minimum wage uh, nationally. Um, but he is using a lot of them. And he's doing it because he's frustrated, because he can't get anything through Congress. Whether or not this is, leads up to executive overreach and something that's, that's threatening our constitutional balance of powers, I'm just not sure. Hi, um, I'm Shubankar. I'm a sophomore in mechanical engineering. Uh, President Daniels here mentioned um, the thing about uh, yeah, civic literacy. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how does money in politics play a part uh, in that playing field? Does it help educate people or is, does it help misdirect people? Hmm. Well, money, there is now a lot of money in politics, a lot of unlimited anonymous money. I don't think it helps educate people. It would be wonderful if um, you know, George Soros and Michael Steyer and the Koch brothers would give a big grant to the League of Women Voters. <laughs> That's something like that. I'm a, I'm a League of Women Voters offspring. That, my mother was in the League of Women Voters um, when I was growing up. Uh, I don't even know if it exists anymore. It's, 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 you don't really hear about it. it does. Yes, okay. Um, but I don't think that it helps. The Supreme Court has ruled that, you know, it's, it's constitutional to do this. Um, and I don't want to say that they misinform people because I, I'm not aware of that. I think that they are, the money is advocacy money and it promotes a point of view on both sides. And, um, but I don't think it helps civic, civic literacy. Well, my name is Jonathan. We uh, met earlier at President Daniel's house. Um, I'm a senior in political science. Uh, my question is about the democratic value of um, the United States government and its viability. With the, uh, the obvious demonstration of the pow uh, political power um, by a single party in gerrymandering, uh, with the slackening of regulations on campaign finance rules, uh, and all those, um, the increasing amount of executive orders, what do you think about the viability of American democracy? Does it seem like it's decreasing or that we're becoming less democratic as we move on, or are we doing just fine? Hmm. I don't know if we're doing just fine, but American democracy is very viable. I mean, I don't feel like like we're coming to the end here. Um, I think that American democracy is completely viable. I think that there's not too much that can't be solved by some real leadership. Um, I think the American people want their representatives to work together. People understand what the problems are um, that they want solutions to. I mean, I gave a short list before, but I think if, you know, you had tax reform and entitlement reform and infrastructure investment and education investment and, and an immigration reform, um, I think you know, that would be a great thing. And so I don't think it's because people don't know, you know what the problems are. I think the things that you mentioned are not good things for our system, but I don't think that they threaten the foundations. Let's go over here. Uh, Joe Cross, a local endangered Democrat, uh precinct committeeman. I'd like to know uh, what you could tell us about, what, what, what are your colleagues and others picking about the effect of the voter suppression acts that have been taking place throughout the country, which incidentally sort of began in Indiana? Um, I, there are a lot of new voter ID laws, and there have been some curtailment of early voting, and I think the, the effect of that is being studied really closely and we just don't know yet. One thing that happened in Florida the last time when early voting was curtailed, it caused a big backlash and even more African Americans turned out to the polls. So we're not quite sure what the effect will be. Um, there's a patchwork of new laws. Some of them have been stayed by the courts, some of them haven't. And I think the answer is we just have to wait and see after election day and then there'll be plenty of data on this about what effect it really had. Thank you. My name is Kamal. I'm an international student from Algeria. I'm a PhD student in English. Uh, Purdue has recently conducted a survey with the Pew Research Foundation, and they found that students who um, 
receive, feel like they receive a great deal of emotional support from professors, end up with basically great lives and great careers. Uh, that's my understanding. And uh, <laughs> it seems like you have had a great life and a great career, so I wanted to ask you, um, about do you career. feel like you have received you know, emotional support from uh, you know, your professors in college? Do you feel like they have supported you personally and supported your dreams and those kinds of things? And secondly, what can Purdue and Mr. Daniels do here at Purdue to provide that kind of support if you feel that's important to students? Well, Thank I'll you. answer the first question. I'll leave the second one to, to Midge. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, I have been really blessed. I had some really great teachers. I mean, I would say I had one in grade school, one in high school, and one in college. People who were really, really important to me, and I can tell you who they were, Mrs. Nick Towser, my fifth grade English teacher. She looked just like Ann Landers, you know, with the, the little curly uh, black, you know. She was just fabulous, really tough, and she really taught me how to write. In high school, there was a guy named Werner Feig. He was a um, refugee from Germany. He was incredible. He taught American history, and um, he was in just super inspiring. And I had a wonderful, wonderful American history professor in college, John Thomas, who I wrote my thesis with. Uh, and I don't know about Mrs. Nick Tizer, but Werner Feig and John Thomas are both passed away. But they were great. And I couldn't have asked for anything better or you know, more inspiring. I actually was very honored and pleased to be asked recently to contribute a little essay to a, a, the Brown University Reader. It was just a thing they published on the 250th anniversary of Brown, and I wrote it about, about Professor Thomas. But yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, you know, these are people who not only wanted to hear my ideas, they expected me to have some. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were, they were all, they were kind of, all three of them were formidable and scary, but really warm and encouraging. In other words, I think that's a great combination. You should be a little bit scared of your professors, but then within five minutes you realize that they are really just completely mush inside and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and have your back in every way. But I'll leave the second, the second question to Mitch. You, mush inside? Well, no, you know what I mean, they're just... You haven't spent any time in our mechanical engineering <laughs> department, have you? No. No, I could never, yeah. I couldn't have made it in your mechanical uh, You know, Kamal, that is such, I'm, I'm <laughs> genuinely glad you asked. It's a really important question for us all here. You're quite right. It's the Gallup-Purdue index that you're referring to. It did find that the strongest single correlate with lifetime success, not just material success, but in the five domains that Gallup measures for countless clients, was, uh, was uh, uh, among those who said that there was at least one professor, uh, one, one faculty member in college who inspired them or with whom they, uh, they felt they had a, some sort of a mentor relationship. And so the two things that come to mind are we, we, we're trying to promote that idea. It's something that all, most of our faculty try to do, I know, but uh, we, can't, uh, 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 we can't stress it enough. On the flip side, I've, I say to many, many, uh, to our students everywhere I encounter them, don't be bashful. If, you know, seek out that faculty member who, who uh, you admire or who is teaching something you're intensely interested in. And you know, don't hang back. And um, uh, uh, you'll probably get the, the, the response you're looking for if you do uh, approach uh, that person. But this is really important, and we are trying in every way we can think of to spread that data around and encourage, uh, encourage our uh, faculty to uh, act on it. You know, when we went out and surveyed the Purdue alums recently to see this was the whole point all along anyway, to be accountable and to have a national benchmark to compare to. And we didn't come out particularly well on that. And we're a big school. It's harder to do here, of course, than at a much smaller university. But it doesn't exonerate us of our, of our uh, duty to do it as much as possible. And I just hope it, it works uh, both from the push and pull end. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, my name is Tom August. I'm one of the local clergy. Uh, I've been listening to NPR since uh, my mom first t turned on my hearing as a little itty bitty person. And thank you, Mara, for your years of service to the community. Um, it's been sort of my sense. Um, I'm not particularly, you know, wildly politically uh, educated, but it's sort of been my sense that the Tea Party has overreached themselves and that uh, they're perhaps maybe even on the way out. I, I love your opinion. And I am also sort of concerned for our, the phrase you used is diverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, diversity of opinion, um, that in some ways this, uh, this bickering, which personally makes me extremely tired, uh, <laughs> is where everybody is at extremes, you know, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that's sort of also, uh, pushing people to the fringe, turning people off. Um, I just would appreciate your thoughts. Well, in terms of the Tea Party, I don't know if it's kind of disappeared. I think it's been more comfortably absorbed inside the Republican Party than it was at the beginning. I think when you looked at the Republican nominating process in the last two cycles and then this cycle, you can really see the establishment taking back the reins and it was kind of like the empire strikes back. I mean, they weren't gonna, the last two cycles, Republicans basically snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. I mean, they lost a lot of Senate races they should have won because Tea Party candidates were nominated. Either they were too extreme or they weren't ready for prime time, but this year that didn't happen. I think the Tea Party hasn't really gone away. I just, it certainly, had an effect on the Republican Party, it moved it to the right. But I think it's been absorbed pretty nicely inside the party. That's usually happen what happens to movements like that, because our two-party system is so vibrant and resilient, it, it, we, don't, we don't end up with a third party. It just gets absorbed in, inside one party. Um, and then what was the other question was just about being- That, that, the, that seemed to me to be sort of an example of the extremism across yeah. the political spectrum. Yeah, well, the, you know, that's, that's a problem. I mean, parties do best when they have a big overlap with the center of the American political spectrum. And I think the Tea Party, for a moment, threatened to kind of pull the Republicans too far to the right. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Um, in the next Republican primary for president, you're going to have a really, really great debate, and you're going to have a lot of mainstream conservatives, maybe Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, you know, Bobby Jindal, you're gonna have the Ted Cruz's and the Rand Paul's. I mean, the Republican Party in a lot of ways is up for grabs and how it's gonna resolve the social issues. I think one of the most interesting things that's happened recently is when the Supreme Court came out with that ruling that basically paved the way for gay, gay marriage, you know, nationwide. What was the Republican reaction? Silence, mostly, except for the, you know, Ted Cruz and and Mike Huckabee, of course, you know, the social issue conservatives were angry, but the Republican leadership in Washington didn't make a peep. So I think that, um, you know, things are changing. We talked about millennials. You know, gay marriage is kind of a threshold issue, issue for young voters. They don't really want to listen to you if you, they think you're an intolerant party. And um, I think that there is a future for fiscally conservative, socially moderate um, politicians, and I think that might be might be where we end up. Let's go over there. Hi, my name is Michael Locke. I'm a first year student studying industrial management at the School of Cranert. And I wanted to ask you about immigration. It's been kind of in limo for a while. Do you think it poses a threat to the rule of law? And do you think an enforcement only policy uh, is a viable solution for immigration? Does immigration a threat to the rule of law? You mean? Yes, with 11.5. Oh, you mean with all people coming illegally over the border? Right, yeah. and the, the um, things that Obama's doing to grant them amnesty. Right. Well, first of all, when Obama does issue his executive orders, we'll see what the reaction to that will be. That's gonna be a really interesting moment for, for everyone. We don't know exactly what he's gonna do, and we don't know how the Republicans are gonna react. Um, I think that the immigration system is broken. Both parties agree with that. It needs to be reformed. The legal immigration system needs to be reformed. I. According to economists, by 2016, we are going to have a shortage of legal skilled labor in this country. So something has to be done about that. I mean, I think it was George Schultz who used to say we should staple a green card to every PhD, you know, that's issued in this country. Um, and, um, but the big sticking point is what to do with the 11 million people who are here illegally. 
You want to deport them all, leave them in the shadows, that's a form of amnesty, and that certainly is against the rule of law, or do you want to find some way to legalize them or put them on a path to citizenship? But that's the debate that, they, that we had in the United States Senate, and they passed a bill um, that resolved this problem. The president would have signed it. I think he would have signed something even more to the right of that if the House had passed something too, but they didn't. So I think we'll see what happens next year, what the president does by executive order, and whether the House of Representatives and the new Senate want to tackle this issue before the next presidential election. Thank you. Now only one of you can ask the question, so. <laughs> we'll take the little yeah. guy, right? <laughs> Uh, my name is Stacey Studeville. I came up from Indianapolis to hear you tonight. Oh, and um, you touched a little bit on campaign finance reform. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the future of that, where that's going to go, because it seems like the amount of money is just staggering that is spent in elections. And then also, I would love your thoughts on the Democratic primary for 2016. Oh. And thank you. <laughs> the Democratic primary, that's pretty easy because there's not much of one. But anyway, the, the, the question about, the, question about the, the campaign finance, I think I called him Michael Steyer, I meant Tom Steyer. But in any event, there's, I don't think much can be done. If you're talking about getting money out of politics at this point, I don't see how we put the genie back in the bottle. I do think, though, that it's a pretty even arms race from what I've read about the, the actual measurement of how many dollars are in there. I mean, conservative versus liberal dollars, it's pretty even. Uh, but it is a tremendous amount of money, and um, it gives these billionaires a tremendous amount of clout, and they can almost create these independent political parties with their own data operations and ground games and advertising budgets, and that's, I think, you know, something that the two parties really have to wrestle with. Um, in terms of the Democratic primary, there's really only one candidate on the Democratic side for 2016, Hillary. And I, think, I don't know if we've ever before had such a prohibitive front runner. I mean, something like 65% of the, De the Democratic Party you know, are backing her. Um, I think that she is the prohibitive favorite for the, for the nomination. I think that getting the White House will be a much harder task. It's very hard to become the, to succeed a two-term president of your own party. And only George H.W. Bush has done that in the modern era. So I think that will be very difficult. But I do think the, one of the things she's going to have to, um, it's a high class problem, but one of the things she's gonna to have to confront is if she doesn't really have any opposition, how is she gonna keep the excitement going throughout the primary process when you're gonna have this unbelievably robust debate on the Republican side? Uh, with a tremendous amount of excitement. Long primaries, we have learned, we used to think that they were debilitating, they bankrupted anybody. It turns out that long primaries can be really good for parties because they generate excitement, you can build what they call capacity, you know, volunteer networks, you know, uh, grassroots infrastructure in all these states that help you in the, in the general election. Hi, my name is Akhil Ranka and I'm doing Masters in Industrial Engineering. My question is what you do to handle with the immense work pressure which you might have at this point of time. Wait, t can you repeat that? How to handle work what? Work pressure? What you do to handle the immense work pressure which you Work have. pressure? Yeah. Oh, well I come out here and talk to Mitch Daniels and you know, and then I just, all the pressure that goes away. That was right out, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know, you know, when you've done something that you really like and you've done it over time and you also have a family, you just, kind of learn to be efficient and balance things. And my NPR is a pretty good employer. Um, I, I don't know, I just managed to work it out. I don't feel un overwhelmed or anything. So we got, let's take the last two that are here and we'll start over here. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Katie Bean and I'm a um, high school social studies teacher. Oh, great. Um, but I recently, just a couple weeks ago, I heard um, on the Diane Rehm show on NPR, uh, Senator Kristen Gillibrand speak. And she's the female senator who took Hillary's seat. Right. And recently wrote a book called Off the Sidelines, really encouraging women um, to engage more in the political process. I mean, actually run for elections. And it got me wondering, how, what is the percentage of women currently in me members of Congress, and how important do you think it is to diversity and just having you know, the other gender uh, more engaged in the political process? 
Well, first of all, I'm really sorry to say I don't have the number on my fingertips of what percentage of Congress are female, but I can tell you it's a lot lower than, than the number, the percentage of women in the population. So uh, women definitely lag behind, although there are more women in the pipeline, and that's the most important thing. You got to start somewhere. Running for school board, you know, or a local office is, is a good way to start. Um, you know, women are 53% of the electorate, and the women's vote is really important. Um, I think that more female senators from both parties, uh, you know, are inspirations to women who want to enter politics. <clears throat> and it is tough. Now, Kristen Gillibrand has little kids. That's the other thing. There used to be a different model. Women got into politics after their kids were grown. Um, <clears throat> but now you have more and more young mothers in Congress. And uh, I think that's an important thing for, for people to understand, that it is possible to do that. Last question. All right, my name is Fiona Thompson and I study uh, computer information technology here at Purdue. Um, grew up listening to you on NPR with my father, so it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Um, I was just, you mentioned this evening about uh, the need for leadership in Congress and how it's um, for that divide to be kind of gapped, that, that some, there needs to be a, new leadership skills. Do you think that this is something that can be taught to people or is this um, is the role of Congress um, man or woman um, dominated by a specific personality type that causes these types of disparity in leadership? No, I don't think it's the personality types. I really think that left to their own devices, I think that most members of Congress would like to get things done. And, and more of them would like to work across the aisle than do now. Um, but, you know, there is a system where there are punishments for that. And, you know, you can see the number of Republicans, for instance, who got Tea Partied, you know, got a primary from a, from a Tea Party opponent. Now, the good thing is this year, the Republican Party kind of came to the aid of a lot of those people um, and proved that they were willing to push back. But um, I think. People in Congress have the leadership skills, they just have to exercise them and be brave enough to take a risk. Sure, thank you. So I gave what um, our guest uh, protested was, was too effusive a, uh, an introduction, but I think you'll agree after the answers that we've all just enjoyed that I should have gone on longer and been <laughs> more extravagant in my praise. <laughs> Can't we uh, all be grateful that America still has journalists the, ca the caliber and uh, of the character of Mara Lyson? Thanks for coming to Purdue. Thanks for having me.